Okay, everyone, welcome back um, to the virtual previous vendor summit for November. Um, so our next talk is going to be from James, who's going to be talking about the performance and scalability of AltCube and FreeBSD. So I'll hand it over to James. Okay, thank you. So let me make sure I do this right. Um, I'm going to share this screen and see if that works. Okay, there we go. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, as he said, I'm going to talk about <laughs> parallelization of the um, hierarchical fair sharing um, algorithm within PF and Alt Q. Um, and sorry, I've got to get to the right screen here. So, a little bit about me, just so you know who I am. I'm a professor of computer science at, at Kenyon College in Ohio. Um, I have a, a somewhat long history working in BSD stuff and in networking and Wi-Fi. I was part of the team way back in the late 1990s and early 2000s that developed, helped um, that developed a Wi-Fi router product that we, that we um, licensed to Lucent Technology in the Netherlands and that became the, the their, their residential gateway series, which was, was the first wireless router. Um, and the first Wi-Fi router. And then um, we basically, th that was then sold or um, licensed to Apple and became the Apple Airport back in, I guess it was late 1999, 2000. And then I have developed some other router products in the early 2000s and through the 2010s in um, NetBSD and in FreeBSD. And currently I've been working um, currently on my own on some improvements to the, you know, performance improvements to FreeBSD. So that brings me to the topic. Um, so Alt-Q is a um, alternate queuing mechanism that's part of the PF architecture, the packet filter architecture in FreeBSD. And um, there is an algorithm, there's several algorithms within it. And one of them is the hierarchical fair service curve, which is developed at Carnegie Mellon I don't know, about 20 years ago. And um, it's a very nice bandwidth shaping algorithm because it provides a rich sets of, set of features for hierarchically managing lots of users with lots of different um, um, rules, both, both in terms of bandwidth, burst bandwidth, um, real-time commitments, um, et cetera. And it allows you to group things into groups and subgroups and subgroups within those so that those groups share bandwidth fairly with each other, fair, fairly with each other. And so the idea is, is that you can have lots and lots of connections and each connection gets a fair share of what the discipline says is uh, appropriate, you know, given the capability of the of the of the, of the maximum available bandwidth. Um, so anyway, so we it, we end up with sort of a tree like thing, and this is actually from the original seminal paper. Um, so the the bandwidths are fairly sh short, uh, fairly slow. But um, the idea is is that um, in the leaf nodes um, there are our users or connections and they're sharing bandwidth of their parents, which are sharing bandwidth of their parents all the way up to some actual physical interface. Um, now, the, and it works really well, and I'm not gonna go any, talk any more about it, but it works very nicely. You can have hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of connections and nobody gets starved and everybody gets a reasonably equitable share based on the, on the rules that you that you set up. The problem is, is Alt Q is ultimately single core, and um, the and the reason that is is because the tree that we were just looking at, the way it works, there's a lock on the entire tree, and so um, and I'm going to talk about that um, why that is. That forces all traffic to be serialized through a single core and, um, you know, which isn't a problem with slow interfaces, but when you're, when you have 40 to, you know, 10 to 40 gigabit interfaces, you, you, 
you can't even get close to that. You might be able to get, um, you know, two or three gigabytes in each direction, and that's it. Um, now, if you don't use Alt Q, some of you may know that the the the, the network um, stack has been um, parallelized, and and RSS receiver side scaling has been added, so that you can do full line speed network um, throughput through the kernel just fine, but you can't with Alt Q. Um, so that's a problem. So, you know, so I decided to look into that and see why, if that could be fixed. The other part of the problem is what if you want to have a system with lots and lots of users? What if, what's the point of scaling it to, to high throughput if you can't have a lot of users? So that's the other, the other side of the thing uh, of what I'm looking at is how can we scale all Q to have a hundred thousand plus simultaneous users or streams or you know user classes because you could have the same user with multiple streams. Um, how can you do that? And the second thing is is can we get the bandwidth up to to match modern interface speeds? Um, so we're going to look at the can we handle lots and lots of queues, lots and lots of users. And it turns out that right up front, there's a basic fundamental limit because the queue ID, and you need a queue for every, every you know, user class, um, was only 16 bits. So I had to, I had to increase that to 32 bits, um, which is enough for the foreseeable future, but we needed to do that to get past 65K. So the next problem is, under test conditions, I noted that when you have lots and lots of classes, it takes a really long time to load PFCTL. Now, that may not be a problem if you only have to do it once, but in a dynamic system, you may, may need to reload PFCTL a, you know, relatively um, um, uh, a lot because as the system dynamics change and you have more users, you may need to basically reload everything. Well, it turns out that it was really slow and I looked in the code and I'm gonna show you how slow later, but it was, well, um, um, with 100,000 queues, it took many, many minutes to load a large set of queues. And so when I looked in there, there was, there was basically what it was doing was inside the kernel, it was, as it was adding the queues, it would add a queue to the end of a linked list. Then when it added the next queue, it would go to the end of the linked list and add it. And then it would go to the end of the linked list for that and add it. And we ended up with an N squared um, um, algorithm when we didn't need it. It didn't matter what order the queues were in. So I simply added it to the beginning of the queue and we went from 120 seconds to load it to five seconds for 100,000 plus um, queues. And that was actually upstreamed into the official release this summer. Um, the next thing um, I noticed was the parsing itself was taking a long time. And so I looked in the code, same problem in the parser. The parser was every time it added a queue, it had to see, well, does this queue already exist? And it was traversing the queue to check to see if it already existed. Or every time it was adding a queue as a child, it has to find that queue and it was traversing the whole list. So again, we had an N squared loop and I got rid of that by adding a hash table into the, into the parsing process. And that reduced the load time from 90 seconds to 10 seconds. Um, and so these times, by the way, it was 120 seconds in the kernel, 90 seconds in the in the user land, and so I'm reducing time on both sides. And so we can we can see this here. Before I fixed this, in this case, it took 109 seconds, and um, I dropped that of user time in 108 seconds. 
of system time and I reduce that to 36 seconds of user time and five seconds of user time. So significantly faster. Um, now, so that, that really helped. You don't do it a lot, but being able to do it um, this much faster was a significant benefit. Well, the, the next thing that you might wanna do if you're running a system, if you're using this in real life, you might wanna be able to collect the statistics and dynamically show which queues are pushing which amount of data. And the only way to do that is to gather the queue statistics. And the typical way of doing that is with the pfctl minus vsq command. Now, it turned out if you run that, say with 100 or 1,000 queues, it comes back virtually instantly. But with 107,000 queues, it literally took 43 minutes to gather the statistics, which of course is, is ridiculous. And what makes it even worse is while you go gathering the statistics for that 43 minutes, the system throughput drops for some reason. I had to figure out why, and I'll tell you why, but the system throughput dropped from about, you, you know, by five to 10 times slower. Okay, why is that? Well, what happens is in, um, to, the first thing it does when it wants to collect the stats, it iterates through all the queues to find out how many there are. Literally, it iterates through them just to count them. Then it goes back through and it says, I want the first one, and it counts to the first one. It wants the second one, it counts the first one and the second one, it wants the third one. And again, it's this n squared loop. And the big problem there is every time it wants to get a queue to pull the data out of it, it locks the queue, which creates a bottleneck for the kernel that's trying to pass data through those queues. And so not only does it take a long time, it slows your throughput, totally unacceptable. So first thing I did was I thought, well, you know, why do I need to iterate through all of these queues over and over again? So instead, what I did was I created an index of the queues on the first traversal, and then I don't have to iterate into, you know, one at a time, you know, I don't have to go through the list over and over again. And so that re reduced the time of traversing the queues to get the statistics from n squared to n, but it still slows the throughput because you still have to lock each one of these nodes when you want to get the, the statistics out of them. So that was still problematic, okay? So it did help though, right? It helped quite a bit. In this case, we see that in the red here, we see that it took 43 minutes <laughs> to get the Q stats out with 100,000, 107,000 Qs. And after it dropped to four, um, minutes and 37 seconds, still unacceptably slow, but 10 to almost 10 times faster. So five minutes is still a lot. So I look back a little closer and I come up with another idea. And that is, is why do I actually need to, to do something to the queues, to lock the queues when I want to get the data out? And so what I did was I created a separate program to collect the data statistics, and I created a separate data structure to collect them in so that it would have no impact on the throughput. So I created a new program called AltQMon for AltQ Monitor to collect these statistics. And what I did then in the kernel was I created an, an, a, an, a, you know, a list or an array of Q stats where each record was indexed by the QID, and it kept all of the queue statistics that we care about, and I'm only showing a few here, packets sent, bytes sent, packets dropped, queue length, et cetera. All of those are stored in this data structure as the system is running. There's virtually no co cost for the um, kernel to update these for very, very low cost as it's passing traffic through. And then when I wanna collect the statistics, I can just zip through this data structure order in time, no locks. And I also made alt QMon instead of returning text, it returns either text or, whoops, sorry, 
I am messed up. Or JSON, which I thought was a useful thing. Maybe not, but it does. I think it is. So this fast reporting of network statistics using alt QMON, um, remember collecting use, using PFCTL using the existing method that slowed throughput and took a while, took four minutes and 37 seconds, which was a 9.5 times speed up. But when we use this new method, it drops it to less than a second, 0.11 seconds. So it was a remarkable speed up, right? So this alt QMON allows us to gather the Q stats um, virtually instantly with 100,000 Qs um, and it scales. Okay, so that's, that's sort of part one, getting the system to even work with lots and lots of Qs. Second problem is, can we increase the throughput beyond what we can push through a single core? And again, to sort of summarize the problem is a core cannot just physically cannot process packets at the same speed as, as, our, as new 10 and 100 gig interfaces, or maybe even what if you wanna to go to a 100 gig interface? Well, the problem is, is that the classes are stored in this potentially huge tree with one node per class. Each node contains a queue of waiting packets and um, the children of each parents are stored as linked lists of siblings. So we have all these lists that we have to process. Every time an interface wants a, wants a packet, it has to go through this tree and figure out which packet has the best next release time, you know, and this is called the eligible list. Which packet is is eligible to go, and which one deserves to get next to get released next based on the, the queuing discipline. Um, the only way to do that without having a race condition, because these linked lists are being changed all the time, is to lock the entire tree. And I actually spent a lot of time trying to see if I could only lock individual parts of the tree and I wasn't I, I failed that just did not work and so I had to try something different so what I did was is I basically paralyzed the entire tree structure I create multiple identical Q trees one per transmit buffer so this is an illustration if I want to use four transmit queues and we're not limited to four but if I want to have four I replicate the entire queues tree four times. And then I use receiver side scaling to push streams randomly. I'm not gonna get into all of the details of RSS in this talk, but RSS basically ha does a hash on various pieces of the packet header and, and pushes streams through various queues without, par without parallelized alt queue RSS would just be pushing packets through different hardware queues directly. But I create these multiple trees in between RSS and the queues. And it works, okay? So RSS nicely balances the stream. And I'm not sure why it doesn't give us a full four times, but it gives us about three times the performance throughput when we use four trees. But there's a caveat. <laughs> And the problem is, of course, when we have four trees, and if we have rules about, you know, maximum throughput per stream, and not per stream, but per user, if a user is associated with a, with a leaf node with a particular class, and let's say they're limited to a certain bandwidth, that's only gonna work within a given tree. And if you have multiple Q trees, they're going to push multiple times the a lot, you know, the specified bandwidth. I'm going to um, show an example of this. So, if you have four streams assigned to have ten megabits upper of uh, uh, um, upper limit Q, RSS is going to um, steer those into the different trees randomly, and if they all go to four separate trees you know, that particular queue 
discipline is going to get 40 megabytes, which is four times what it deserves, right? So how do you fix that? Well, what I'm working on right now is, is something called a scoreboard. And the idea is that when uh, I'm, I was already um, saving this information about throughput in the array for alt QMon, so I'm going to reuse that. And so what happens is I keep score of how much um, throughput is going through each tree on a per queue basis. And then what I can do is aggregate that data and add it to each of the other trees computations. So each tree limits each user to the correct amount of um, throughput. Now, so how did I do that? Well, I added this local byte sent and a class pointer and a timestamp basically to each record for each queue. And then what happens is, is every 10th of a second, I try to reconcile the differences. In other words, if we have the same, um, the same user in this case is pushing data through four different queues, it could be four streams, it could be a hundred streams, however many streams that particular user is using, they're gonna be using the four different trees. And you know, it's not just a single class because remember this is hierarchical. So in this case, we have four, um, four inherited queue struct, you know, queue classes that we're going through. And what we have to, what I do is I total up the throughput in each, for each class in each tree and add it to all the other ones. So here I show this here. So this gets added into here, this gets added into here, this gets added into here. And the same is done to here. All of these three are added into the one on the left. All of the other three are added into this one. And I add that into the cumulative that I'm accounting for in the, um, in the, in the HFSC um, algorithm. And sure enough, it works. We get the correct amount of overall throughput across all of the um, all of the um, all all of the separate trees. So, by you know to, again to review by adding the data that is passed through the sisters to the CL total, this is a this is a value within the HFSC algorithm. HFSC will consider the data passing through all of the sister trees and we get the correct cumulative throughput. Um, and by the way, haven't really talked about it. We also have to fix it the same way for um, the guaranteed rates. Guaranteed rates are when you basically provision a user and say you're guaranteed to have this throughput. You also have to adjust it for that. Now, I did notice when I did this that certain, certain trees would get out of balance and there would be starvation. And so I fixed that by basically putting a lower limit on, um, the, uh, on when I would add this X, the values of the sisters in. And so basically, if anything was less than one fourth of its one over n, if you have n queues, um, I decided, well, I'm going to not limit that one and let it naturally rise back up. And then when it gets past that lower limit, it seemed to bring it back into balance. And so this seemed to work really well. I didn't see the starvation anymore. It appeared to push up the lower throughput queues and keep them in balance. Now, where are we at with all this? This works, but there's an issue. <laughs> and here's the issue, and I'm still working on this. It's cache contention. Now, I don't, you know, I, I, I won't go into a great deal of detail here, but what cache contention is, is when multiple, anytime a core accesses memory, um, and if it writes to that memory, if any of the other cores have cached values from that same memory, 
that cache is invalidated, which means that the next time they access that memory location, they have to reach through cache all the way down into main memory. Now, I did a lot of experiments with this, and it turns out that typically when you invalidate a cache it, on memory and you do it all the time, it slows processing by about 10 times because cache memory is about 10 times as fast as the, act, as the actual RAM. And so that's a real problem. And so I don't get as much throughput as I should because there's contention somewhere. And I've spent a lot of time looking at this and I'm still looking at that. A couple of other issues are fair sharing is, is sort of modularized. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And then the third thing is burst mode. Burst mode doesn't, burst mode is when you say, oh, a user can get three seconds of, at three times the normal rate. Well, it turns out you get a burst mode in each Q tree, which isn't really right, but it still works. It's just, you know, not quite as advertised. Um, what's the fair sharing balance? Let's say you have three users, three streams and four queues for a given user. Well, they're going to correctly be divided up into 33 megabits each. Works fine. If you get four, they're going to be divided up into 25 megabits each works fine. Problem is, is if you have five, you, you can't, RSS is only going to push each stream into one queue. And the way this is going to balance them out is it's going to say, I'm going to give 25 megabits per queue tree. And if, you know, by the pigeonhole principle, if you have five <laughs> streams and four queue trees, two of them are going to, at least two of them are going to have to go through one queue and that's going to divide the 25 that that one's going to get between the two. And those individual streams are only going to get 12.5. This is probably not going to be noticeable by most people, but it is an issue. So that's, I don't know how where my time is at and I don't have any idea if I went through in the right amount of time, but that, um, well, I guess I don't have to. Stop sharing. That's my um, talk. So, do we have any questions? Thank you. I'm looking to see. We don't have any in Zoom at the moment, but I'm going to go look on IRC to see if we have any there. Okay. Oops. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Okay. Here, here it goes. Oh, yeah. So we got 17 participants. Okay. So, uh, you know, one thing I'll say while um, we're waiting for questions is, is you know, this work is, is not 100% complete. As I said, I, I still need to figure out the cash contention issue for the, for, it works, but it doesn't work well when I use the scoreboard because of cat, this cash condition ends up slowing down throughput. Um, you know, my it would be interesting. And what I would like to do is upstream this if I solve that problems. And I have talked to people within the FreeBSD community. I'm not a, I'm not a member of the DevOps team. So, you know, I would need to work with somebody and I, I'm interested in doing that. So that was the main question actually that was on IRC where your, your plans for upstreaming. I believe um, I saw you in Vienna and I think you talked with yeah. Christoph quite a bit. Yes, about I did. This. I did talk with Christoph quite a bit. Yeah. And so, you know, this, this is a, is a project <laughs> that I am interested in. Um, so beyond uh, what you just mentioned with still trying to address um, your issues with the scoreboard, are there other plans you have for Alt-Q beyond this or other, other areas you would um, like to work on? Not, you know, it's a good question. And I guess I've been so myop myopically almost focused on, on the scoreboard that I haven't really thought beyond that at this point. So, um, I, but, you know, bigger picture is, is I am interested in, you know, you know, this is sort of driven by, you know, a perceived need um, for, a, you know, for HFSC to be able to work in, in, in a, um, in a situation where you have lots and lots of users, um, I think I've, if this, you know, if this works, I think I've handled most of those. Um, 
Now, this only works with HFSC. Should it work with RED or any of the other ones? That's another thing I could look at if there was interest. So I, I, I guess I'm driven by, by interest from the community. And so if people in the community are, are interested in this work or interested in uh, you know, other related enhancements, I'm game to, to consider that. That's pretty fair. I mean, a lot of development in FreeBSD is driven by interest, um, in the, you know, by people in the community or people using FreeBSD. So right. that's pretty par for the course. I guess one other question we had is, are there other areas in FreeBSD outside of Alt-Q that you've either looked at or considered looking at or might be interesting to you? Um, I mean, I have, I've done some work in with VLANs and you know the VLAN architecture for um, um, you know that's actually a really good point that the VLAN architecture for FreeBSD is is pretty you know it, it, it is a pretty major piece of software and it does create some slowdowns and in fact when I use this solution and I put every, like if I have 100,000 or, well, not even 100,000, if I, let's say I have 1,000 um, different VLANs, I notice that most of my speed up goes away. And I have to believe that's because of either some sort of contention within the VLAN world or, or you know, or overhead in the VLAN world or some sort of um, problem between PF and Alt-Q and VLAN. That's so that that is another issue, and so if you want to use with this with VLANs, it's not as fast as I'd like it to be. I would be interested in looking in the VLAN world. I have in the Linux world, I on a completely separate product project, I developed. Um, I, I, I basically a, I took a, a a Raspberry Pi and wrote a platform to turn a Raspberry Pi into an enterprise-like wireless access point. You know, not like a home router, but an enterprise, uh, you know, a manageable, a controller managed solution where each user would get their own VLAN. And um, I couldn't really get it to work very well with the built-in VLANs within Linux and I, I, I would guess that this would problem would probably exist also with FreeBSD because um, because the um, host APD software that I was using to build this most requires a hardware help for VLANing um, from the Wi-Fi radio um, firmware, and that and it turns out that about five or 10 years ago, most modern hardware doesn't include, you know, what Wi-Fi hardware doesn't include VLAN support. And so what I did was, is I wrote my own, um, my own VLANing bridge as a kernel module for Linux. I could do the same thing in Alt-Q. I mean, I could do the same thing in FreeBSD and see how that, you know, use that as an alternate VLAN because it's a, basically it's a very lightweight VLAN solution because it doesn't involve interfaces. It basically just passes the data through a bridge that does the VLAN tagging on the fly. And so it's, it's very fast and very um, um, minimal in terms of um, CPU loading. So I don't know. So VLANing is another area, yeah. Okay, and then we have a question from uh, Zoom uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Delbert and Ken Murray. He's asked, do you have any plans to parallelize CODAL or other similar alt queue methods? You know, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I haven't really thought about it. I, uh, I have, to be honest with you, I haven't looked at those other disciplines at all. Um, again, if there was serious interest in that, I would, um, you know, I would invite, you know, somebody to contact me, um, and I can, I can look at that code. I don't, I really don't even know how that code works at this point. So I have, you know, very little to say about it. I've really focused exclusively on the HFSC algorithm. 
So I'm not disinterested. I just don't, I don't have a good answer at this point. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Mm -hmm. but thank you very much. Okay, very, so, very interesting talk. Yeah, I, I'm real, you know, I realizing now I designed this talk to be more of a half hour talk. And so I think we ended earlier than we, I probably uh, should. But. We're a few minutes early, but that's okay. Um, we, our, our schedule is pretty flexible, so okay. it's working out just fine. Okay. Thank you very much, James. Sure. Thank you, uh, everyone, so for listening. And, you know, um, feel free to email me also if you have any questions. Um, I guess I didn't. I don't know if I if my email address is included anywhere else, but I'll put it on the slide. Is there some place yeah. I should upload these slides to? Um, Actually, Anne will probably reach out to you and we can put it on the wiki page associated with the summit. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, where was this? Anyway. So, anyway, well, thank you, everyone. I'll stop sure. Here. Thank you, James. So, now we'll take our next break. Um, we'll be back in about um, 35 minutes or so, or maybe I guess it's 40 minutes for the schedule. Um, we'll be back then. So let, folks can head over to the hallway track and we'll see you in a little while back for our next talk. Thank you very much. Thanks.